Hi, everybody. Um, Beth Holland here from EdTech Teacher. Thanks so much to all of you who are joining us this evening. Um, I'm super excited to have Douglas and Saba here, and I know Greg's going to jump in momentarily. Um, so for anyone who's new joining us, I'm one of the instructors of EdTech Teacher, and really excited to know everyone else is here. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, go ahead. Great. OK. Do I need to enable my video, or are you con you're driving that whole thing? Oh, you're good. We see you. Hi. <laughs> okay, great. Hi. I'm Douglas Keong, and I teach at Punahou School in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I teach computer science courses so my kids build apps. Uh, I also am an instructor with EdTech Teacher and I do workshops and get to travel and see what lots of different uh, schools and classrooms are doing. And so uh, we've really embraced design thinking as a way not only to do some brainstorming and get input into some of the redesign of some of the learning environments on our own campus, but also as a real curricular tool. And I'll show you some examples of some different kinds of things that we've done in our curriculum here at the fourth grade level, stuff that I've done at the high school level, as well as just a few ideas about how to actually assess a lot of the, uh, the great thinking that's going on. Oh, hi everyone, I'm Saba and I am um, currently a director of innovative learning over at the University of Southern California and um, like Doug and Beth, I also get to travel to all these awesome places and work with different schools. Um, we've actually embraced design thinking with our students at the graduate level more in terms of using having them develop their capstone projects. Um, and it's um, it's been really great to have them kind of go out and use this and see them apply it in all these um, different areas. So excited to talk here today. Great. Thanks, Saba. And now that Greg's joined us, and thanks for popping in, Greg, hope I'll let him go ahead and say hello as well. Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. Greg Kulwick from EdTech Teacher. I'm an um, instructor on the team, former high school history teacher, and I'm thrilled to be joined um, with everybody on the, the Hangout tonight. I've kind of just begun the process of digging into the implications of design thinking, and I think where it becomes really interesting is um, with schools I've been working with that have, ha you know, have devices, and they're on year two and three with their one-to-one -one programs, and they're kind of thinking, like, what's next? How do we make this powerful and meaningful? And I, I, I like that this is becoming um, the path that schools are considering going down, because I in many ways it has really little to do with technology and way more to do with thinking and creative thinking and developing an effective process to work through problems and the technology can become like a really powerful part um, to push that process forward. So thanks again for having me. All right, so I mean, just to get us started and then I'm actually going to turn it over to everyone, I think, you know, Greg really made a great point. I think all of us have been working with this for not too long, but, you know, really the power of it, and I was laughing with Douglas before we got started where when I first heard about this idea of design thinking I'd heard it within the context of like oh look we designed a chair and like I really didn't understand like what does having a chair have anything to do with like teaching history or learning a foreign language um, and then you know as Greg said though it's really more about this thinking process and I was working with middle school teachers today you know on this process and it was great because it suddenly provided this framework that we could really wrap our heads around the bigger picture of like how do we get students to sit with a problem you know how do we get them to ask really deep questions how do we get them to start to realize that you know it's more than about like just them at this moment at this time and to dig in and to look for things where maybe they didn't even think a problem existed so you know I've seen it a lot lately as well of thinking like how do we use this as a framework to help us start to shift that classroom practice so I'm going to stop talking now. I'm really excited uh, that everyone's here. And I guess, you know, I know we have a handful of slides and things, but I'm going to turn this over to Saba and Doug because I think, you know, I really learned a lot of this from them. So you guys can arm wrestle over who wants to go next. Well, can we, can we throw up Justin's slide? Or I don't know where the slides are here, so. Give me a sec. You talk, I'll put it up. Okay. So, um, you know, some of you may have seen Ken Robinson did a really uh, well-known TED Talk on creativity and the importance of creativity. And I highly recommend that you watch it if you haven't already seen it. 
And the question that we usually get from our teachers when we show them, it's a very inspiring talk about how important it is to value creativity and how we don't always uh, value it, we don't really know how to assess it. Uh, but then the follow-up question I always get from teachers is, well, can you teach creativity? If, if a student either isn't creative or doesn't think that they're creative, can you teach creativity? And the answer that I found is yes, and design thinking is the process by which you can teach creativity. So even students who don't see themselves as creative, who don't necessarily recognize their own creativity when they see it, design thinking gives a very specific kind of framework that you can go through. Anybody can do it. And you can end up with either a chair or a process or a learning environment or a curricular unit. You can actually use design thinking in many, many different ways. But it's, you know, it's really, it's a skill. And the exciting thing about the skill is I think that if we get kids involved with design thinking and, and we teach kids to do some of the, we don't call it by the, the specific terms that we have kids engaging in design thinking skills from the time they're in kindergarten. And we're actually really excited for a lot of these kids when they get up to where I am in the high school. How are these kids going to approach a seemingly intractable problem when they have these skills, the skill set that they've been drawing on for years, but just in lots of different kinds of contexts? So um, I'd like to actually present this framework. Justin Reich is a with EdTech teacher. He's also an EdTech researcher. I really like this framework that he's put together to think about STEAM, what we think about now is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And can I, you, can I forward these slides or is this something that, oh, yes, I can. Oh, oh, all right. So the next slide. So, right. So when you think about science, technology, engineering, art, and math, science and math primarily are concerned with facts and content. So those are, those are the, those content heavy uh, subjects. And when you think about engineering, Engineering is really the application of the science and math facts that you've gotten from those particular classes. So engineering really is all about the application. And then uh, art, in fact, is also about application as well. And more and more we see these examples of you know, sculpture. Um, there are mathematical concepts applied in art. I think one of the exciting things about visual arts is that visual arts are very skills oriented rather than being content heavy like the science and math. So when we think about design, design really is that intersection of engineering and art. Design is the way that engineering and art is expressed. And when you think about applying science and math concepts through engineering and through art, well, you're really thinking about design, ultimately. And technology, where that fits in, is that's really the vehicle that kind of connects all of those ideas. We don't think of technology as a content area in and of itself. It's really the infrastructure that, along which you have all of the, uh, the skills and, and the ways that you're applying the science and math and those kinds of things. So ultimately, when we think about all of these things, you have design thinking. And, and design thinking really is the way that you're thinking about design, applying design towards the application of engineering and art principles that uh, kind of synthesize the science and math. If you don't have engineering art, if you don't have the design, if you just have the science and math and you really are just filling kids' heads with facts, and facts, you know, in today's economy are, are so easily Googleable. I mean, we're really much more interested in the application of those facts and content. And, and you really, we see design thinking as the vehicle for doing that. It doesn't, I'm actually, I'll jump, or. Are there more? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, yeah, Doug, do you want to keep, do you want to go to, like, the next one, or is there something Sure, else? yeah, no, that's it, let's go to the next to. one, yeah, so. Oh, sorry, yeah, so, yeah, right. there's another yeah, one, sorry, Doug. I thought there was another thing, so. Okay. So, the, the thing is, what, what Justin talks about brilliantly is this idea that now you've got the Google drivable car, you know, that they have a computer driving a car. Y you may have seen recently in the news, they just created a computer that I was actually able to beat. Uh, a Go master, and you know, I teach computer science and programming, and so we've always said that. Well, you can create a chess program that it would be another ten years before someone actually is able to create a, a computer that's powerful enough to play Go, because Go is just exponentially so much more complex than chess. And they just did it uh, last week, <laughs> so they did it ten years early. And so more and more problems that are able to be expressed 
in a way that you can describe their solutions with algorithms, if you can write steps to solve them. So structured problems like driving a car, problems that are constrained by parameters like chess or even Go, which is a very complex set of parameters. Uh, if you can get a computer to solve those, then it's really, we, we shouldn't be training kids to solve those problems. We should be training kids to solve ill-structured problems problems where there are uh, aesthetics involved or things that are not easily describable and teaching design thinking is the best way for us to teach kids how to solve those difficult problems. Uh, we had uh, a, a set of, um, well they were sophomores, these two sophomore girls who decided that they wanted to uh, find a way to raise money to help some of the homeless shelters here in Honolulu and they took it on as a design thinking problem and they, their solution was ultimately to create a 5K road race uh, here in Manoa. And it's now in its sixth or seventh year, I think, of, of running it. And that was an ill-structured problem because going about getting the, the permitting pr process, going about and, you know, just all of the different things that they had to go through, look at city regulations, talk to elected officials, raise money, think about safety liability concerns, all of those kinds of things. This is something that had not ever really been done before in this area and certainly not by teenagers but they you know they really use the design thinking process throughout to kind of get them to uh, visualize at first what the challenge was and then see this this road race as a solution to it and then you know one of the other ones was thinking about um, uh, creating kids who would be able to do more uh, to keep the road race going after they graduated and so they had to figure out how do you come up with a handbook and everything else so all of the different kinds of skills that they learn in doing this are the kinds of skills that we're trying to give our kids to solve ill-structured problems. They're knowledge economy skills. Um, and I know, Saba, you're very... Uh, would you be able to speak a little bit to some of these skills since I know that you've done work around those areas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just kind of going off of what you're saying and having kids investigate these problems, I think what's so sort of fascinating, especially with like working with older students, is they think they have all the answers and they think they have all the solutions. It's just a matter of like, well, how do I get other people to do what I think that they should do? And I think one of the reasons I was so drawn to the design thinking model was because it begins with that concept of empathy. And, you know, I think it's easy a lot of times to go in and, you know, you kind of cover problems up with these um, solutions that people come up with and then we slowly kind of see them either fall apart or really not reach the sort of end goal it is that we had in mind. And I think when you have people begin with that empathy piece, not only are they able to learn so much more about each other, about communities, about cultures, you know, different habits and things like that, um, but the solutions that they end up coming up with are much more sustainable. And I think that's one of the things that I, I think is it's an important skill to when you're creating something, you're trying to solve something, is not only is it going to work sort of in that moment, but really is it going to, you know, be something that's sustainable um, for, you know, like many sort of, you know, weeks, decades or whatever it is to sort of come where that can be adjusted as needed. Um, in terms of those skills, I think what's sort of interesting also for a lot of students is, you know, not always knowing um, how to discover a problem or not always knowing, you know, where to begin or where to start. And I know David Terrio um, over here, you know, at Fountain Valley High School has this really cool thing that he does with idea farming. Like, how do you actually get kids interested in solving different problems so that they're, you know, invested in um, the process? And so I don't know, Beth, if you can jump to that idea farming slide that um, David has, um, but he has some really good sort of of like prompting questions that he asks students like what are our needs and our wants you know like what do my friends need and want what does my school or classroom need or want my club or my sports team my community my family and by having students pick topics that they're sort of invested in um, allows them to then kind of you know have that sort of intrinsic motivation to be more um, I think just engaged in the process and you know being able to develop a lot of those skills um, that you know we all I think um, find so valuable. So I am flunking the job right now of being the idea, the slide jockey, but I'm doing my best here. So um, hopefully that's the right one. I'm sorry, Saba. Uh, shout slide numbers at me. Um, you know, but one thing just to tap onto that as well. Um, the last two days I've been working with teachers in Chicago, and one of the things that we focused on was just that part of empathy in the design process. And we spent so much more time there. And the, the revelations even working with teachers of saying, 
you know, what does it mean to be a really good listener? And how do you really start to pay attention to what's going on around you? And digging into that notion has been really powerful to watch as it unfolds because, you know, there were these questions like, well, where do I start with bringing this into my curriculum? And just by starting with empathy, we, we had all these conversations like, how could students say have empathy with characters in a book? Or how could they have, you know, we use different types of thinking routines to have empathy with historical figures or, you know, why do we have these scientific principles and how do they have impact to someone else in their lives? And so we kept coming up with all these different questions that were just situated around like that one idea and we and in a lot of ways we didn't really design anything but just in engaging there we started getting into that critical thinking. Um, so I can turn this back over to someone. I don't know where else we where it looks like Doug has somewhere to go next, so we can I can turn it over to him. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, one of the big features for us is this idea of empathy and that I think the design process, you, you don't always think about it, we think of empathy as sort of a touchy-feely kind of word, but what it really boils down to is if you don't understand the problem, how can you solve it? So I think a lot of the time, what I love is there, there was, we had a, um, Jessica Flannery came and spoke at our school and she started up Kiva.org and Jessica, uh, she must be in her early 30s now, I think, late 20s, early 30s, young woman entrepreneur, very successful. Uh, she created a microfunding website. But she called herself a uh, charity junkie when she was in high school. And that her whole thing was, you know, she was, she was in all these clubs and was constantly holding big sales and, and money. And she had a very si simplistic idea that the answer to third world problems was to throw money at it. And so that her, the best way that she could help as a high school student was to raise money and hold fundraisers. Um, and when she actually started studying and learning more about the problems in the third world, some of the things that she realized was, well, what we really need to be doing that is uh, sort of kickstarting entrepreneurial efforts at the ground level. And so that's when she got into studying about microfunding. And so that, there is an example where the most obvious solution isn't necessarily the best solution. You have to understand the problem first. And often if we put kids to the challenge of, well, we want to help people in another country, usually it's like, well, let's hold a bake sale. And so understanding and learning the empathy piece, that's your content. That's where you're trying to understand the problem and say, okay, well, let's understand from an economic standpoint, from historical um, uh, perspective, you know, what are the issues for the people that you're trying to help? And I think that part is just, it's so important. Am I showing these slides here? Yes. Okay. So, so for instance, one of the activities that we'll do often do is we'll give the kids a challenge to, um, you know, I, I teach an app design class, so it's design an app that helps a new student at school. But this is a great design thinking challenge because so many of us have been new students or know kids who have been new students. And so we'll lead them through this exercise, which I think about, okay, if you wanted to design something, you have to understand first, what are all the questions that you have about your audience, in this case, your client, the, the new student, if we wanted to create something to help them. Um, we might hold a brainstorming session right up on the whiteboard and write down all of these different things. What do we need to know in order to solve this problem? Not jump right to, oh, okay, well, this is what a new student needs. Let's figure out what is it, what are... What are, what's some of the homework that we can do? What's the content that we can gather? Um, you know, what's the experience like of being a new student? Uh, what, what already exists at our school to help new students? Um, you know, what are some example problems? Um, what, what do other places do, for example? Maybe there can be a looking outward phase. Um, has anybody here been a new student? What kinds of things did you end up inventing for yourself to fill those spaces where there weren't support mechanisms for what you wanted to do? And once we collect all of these guiding questions, each of these guiding questions generally has a guiding activity. And usually we'll actually stay in this phase for a good week, maybe week and a half. And this, this is the work of the class. The work is not necessarily jumping to just creating the solution. It's really to try to figure out and understand what are all of these different things. So, you know, perhaps one group decides, okay, to, let's talk to a current new student at the school. Let's interview them. 
um, somebody else, maybe this group reaches out and looks at what other schools have created, what, what kinds of things have they created. Uh, maybe one group wants to actually start building, so we'll create a prototype. We'll start to create that and then test that with different people and gather data. Uh, maybe we can do a survey. Um, what does the current research say about people who are new trying to fit into school? So these are all different kinds of activities. And so, you know, I really try to emphasize, emphasize this a lot with teachers, that you can't, in some ways, you can't spend too much time. You can't, you know, the more time you spend here, the better in terms of thinking through prototyping, changing and adjusting, and then going back. Because the more you understand the problem, the better your solution becomes. Uh, here are some examples. Um, again, I mean, we, we build apps at our, at, in my class. It's something very specific that we do, but this could easily extend to different kinds of classes and things that you might be doing. But for us, we have a carnival. It's a two-day carnival, and some of the kids, as they, well, the kids here, they all know the carnival because it happens every year, <laughs> and they realize that one of the existing problems is that there are only 250 spaces for 30,000 visitors who come to Manoa to go to this carnival. And so their solution was to create an app that kind of helps you locate uh, where open parking spaces are on campus. And also they put up a whole map of, of what uh, the um, campus looks like. And this actually is the content of my class, is learning how to do all of these things. But we did it within the context of building a prototype to answer a lot of these questions that had come up. Um, actually here, the the kids were elated because when you actually publish an app, you can see how many people are downloading it, and they had a almost 2,000 downloads in the first two days, and then on the third day it dropped down to one download. It was just this guy in Turkey who was like a day late for the. It's a two-day carnival, and the kids are a little crestfallen. But we said, well, when you're designing for a two-day festival, on the third day nobody downloads it. But the the whole idea of audience is huge. The idea that you have an authentic audience makes a really big difference in terms of their learning. They worked much harder on this app than when they were just creating apps and turning them in so that I could grade them. Uh, we had another kid who designed an app for a local restaurant and he basically decided to create a way to do curbside delivery or curbside pickup. So you'd put in all of your, you'd order from the menu and then it would send a text notification and then your food would be waiting when you pick it up. But the problem that he ran into, ultimately, after he finished the app, he solved lots of difficult problems. Uh, but the problem is the restaurant doesn't offer a full menu. They mostly just serve shave ice. And shave ice in Hawaii is kind of like a snow cone. And snow cones don't really do very well with curbside pickup. Nobody wanted to order a snow cone and have it waiting out there at the curb in 10 minutes in the, for 10 minutes in the, in the Hawaiian sun. So, you know, this is an example where this student jumped right to the solution really didn't spend long enough in the empathy piece because had he gone and talked to the restaurant or really looked at the menu, he would have figured out, oh, okay, this isn't going to work very well. Maybe I should choose a different restaurant. But the student fell in love with the concept and wanted to build this and wanted to learn this. And from the outside, it looks like an authentic product because they're building something. It's for a restaurant. But in reality, nobody's going to use it. So when we think about authenticity, it's designing a solution that is authentic based on what you understand the problem to be. So I've got another couple of students who were athletes and they, for their independent project, had to do an app and they just didn't know what to do. And so I asked them, what, what is something that you know really well? What is something that you spend a lot of your, what is some place where you are a lot of the time where you really understand it? And they said, well, a lot of our season we're injured. And we're sitting in the uh, in the rehab room, sort of re rehabilitating. And so they realized they they decided to build an entire app around some of the more common exercises that you do to rehabilitate yourself from injuries. Something they knew pretty well, unfortunately. Um, and so they actually had a video associated with each of these exercises. And they actually went and hired a model to actually do the exercises properly so they could shoot the videos. And I was actually really proud of my guys because they started with no idea what to do. And they went through having to collaborate and plan and find ways to explain what would, you know, articulate what they wanted to have happen. And um, they did all of this stuff before they even got to the actual content of my course, which is building the, the app and putting it in the store. So they they did a lot of they had a lot of these other skills that they had a chance to kind of reinforce through this design process. Another one of my students worked with a parent of an autistic child 
and she had worked out a way for autistic kids to learn how to count, but she had no way to share it. And so he helped to create this app, and it's actually in the App Store right now, and it's being used now all over the world by uh, kids and parents and therapists and teachers and people on all ends of the autism spectrum. And what was really neat about this was that this app probably never would have been made if it weren't for this connection between my, you know, this parent who really knew nothing about app development and my student who actually really didn't know anything about autism. And now they each know a whole lot more because they've had a chance to work together on this. And that's, that's, some, that's a way that the design thinking process brought them together. I had another kid who did an app for a local child psychologist on helping kids whose parents are getting divorced. And it provides lots of interactive uh, features, um, ways for kids to learn about some uh, different kinds of vocabulary. They are allowed to express, it allows them basically to use their artwork to express some of their feelings. And it's designed for the parent and the child to go through together. And what was really interesting about this app is it started out uh, just as a simple school project, but through the design thinking process, it became a way for this student to help other children of divorce. And so, you know, I think when I changed over my course to start really using design thinking, I started getting kids describing, because I have an end of year survey, you know, what did you learn? And rather than saying, well, I learned how to create a view controller and link it to a table, or I learned how to use this tool, what I'm getting more, much more things like this, you know, that I learned perseverance, that I learned how to do something that was super, super difficult, uh, that I learned that if I can make a difference and help somebody else, that it kind of makes all of this work worthwhile. And those are a lot of the things that I think the benefits that I've gotten from this. And so this list of skills, these kinds of things that we're trying to get done, that were, you know, that are the top 10 skills, um, that we see in the next five to ten, actually this is an Us as a World Economic Forum, when you think about all of these skills and how they are really embedded within the content of what I'm trying to teach in my course, um, I wouldn't be able to involve kids in doing these kinds of things if it weren't for this process. So I'm going to let other people jump in at this point. <laughs> Uh, no, thanks. Dick. There's actually uh, Mary Cantwell's joined us in the in the chat, and I know I've actually been learning a lot from her as well about design thinking. And she made a great point, Doug, while you were talking, where she she said, you know, it's really like this empathy piece that sets design thinking apart from just you know design yep. or just from like maker you know maker education or making things. Like you know, you can't call it design thinking without having empathy and user you know and like that user feedback. And so. You know, maybe if we can, at this point, I think it's awesome that we've got these ideas now of what does it potentially look like with some specific projects, but maybe we can back up a hair, um, and I'll turn this over to anyone who wants to, and we can, I have the right slide this time, uh, and okay. you know, kind, of, <laughs> kind of talk through the process. Like, what is this design thinking process? Because I think we've, we've touched on it a little bit, but maybe we could come back to that part. So I'm going to pull up the correct slide if one of you wants to talk to it. How's that? Okay. Okay. I would I would love to um, join in a bit on this part of the discussion. In facilitating workshops where, and I was really fortunate able to do this with Beth in a workshop where we ran the whole workshop with teachers for the day. It was you know through the lens of design thinking. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that in the beginning, if we're if we're following the model the way it's laid out, we didn't start with presenting them with a problem to to solve and address and figure out. We started with them addressing, you know, coming up with their own scenario or whatever environment they were going to explore. Um, th they came up with a topic that they were interested in, and then, and that wasn't even coming up with the problem first. Like, they were coming up with ideas. Teachers are developing ideas. Like, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to have a, a more valuable, um, you know, end of year assessment, or I'd like my classroom to be more conducive to collaborative, um, you know, work. So that wasn't even a problem that they were defining or identifying. That was just a scenario. Like this is the scenario we're in. Then, through kind of like an informal interview process, working through like having empathy for one another's scenario, that's how they were able to define a problem. And 
I feel like it was an invaluable process for the teachers to work through because it gave them a firsthand sense of what design thinking actually feels like. And I think one of the struggles was we didn't give them a problem and said, here, solve this problem. We said, you know, identify a scenario and identify a situation and then empathize with your colleague and what their situation is and then try to define what the problem is that you're going to work through and try to address and come up with valuable solutions based on their first-hand experience. And in many ways, that's the complete opposite of what we do with students in a classroom. We give them the information, we give them the problem before they even get started, and we tell them how they're going to solve it based on the information we give them. So I think one of the struggles is, like, I find the process to be invaluable. I think one of the challenges is it's that mindset still of, like, okay, I'm a history teacher, where does design thinking fit? Or I'm a science teacher, where does design thinking fit? Instead of maybe looking at the other way around, like design thinking is the lens in which we can help students understand history or understand science. And maybe that's the wrong way of thinking about it. I'd love to hear what Saba or Beth or Doug has to think about this. But I think that's the biggest thing that I struggle with right now. And I feel like with teachers that we're working through this process with is how, what does this have to do with my topic, my content, and how do I use it to teach my topic or my curriculum? Yeah, those are all great points. I think that... Um... Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, my class tends to be very product oriented, but you know, I can see lots of ways to apply this towards, you know, what if scenarios in history, for example. Um, the the five steps of the process, just briefly. Uh, there, there's a lot of great resources. I think we'll put up some resources on the web uh, as well. This is, you know, design thinking was a process that was started by IDEO originally, but um, what I love about it is it's it's open-ended enough that teachers can customize it in many different ways. But ultimately, you start with really um, empathizing and understanding what are the issues, articulating what those issues are in a regular curricular unit. Um, you know, those could be, you know, kids could be producing either written stuff or videos, things talking about, you know, their perspectives. Um, research fits in really well there. Um, and then you're actually working towards defining what is it? That's that's where I think I get kids trying to trying to define what it what is it about this area that's really interesting to me? You know, what is it that um, either a alternate scenario that I'm going to construct, or some kind of uh, another theory, um, hypothesis, and in, in science perhaps? And they're trying to kind of trying to define this and and test it. ID, ID, ideating, right? it's even hard for me to say that word. I think about, about that, that is brainstorming. And really, the traditional rules of brainstorming, we usually try to apply these in my class where you know, anybody can throw in lots and lots of different ideas. You're, you're really throwing stuff at the define, at the define uh, statement, trying to see what sticks. And then the whole prototyping and testing is kind of an iterative phase so we can stay in the prototyping testing it out seeing how does this work with other people getting people's feedback going and talking to people and coming back in again um, I've seen some classes do this some classes where they're actually having kids writing papers and getting feedback on their rough drafts on their drafts and testing things out that's the draft is like the prototype and the testing is the feedback and rather than rushing right through to you know let me turn this in for a grade they're actually, you know, basically writing and revising. Um, in English class, a lot of our uh, writing revision cycle happens right in those two, those two spots there. And so again, it's really um, a vocabulary and a framework for a process that I think, in many ways, especially in a lot of our science classes, a lot of this is happening anyway. It's just having a common vocabulary helps kids to kind of see those connections and make these multidisciplinary connections and kind of break it out of this content specific uh, process like the scientific method for it is, for example and start to see this as, as more of a universal uh, creative process that can be applied in many different contexts. I would also add on I think one of the things that I find so fascinating about bringing this into like you know traditional curriculum is I think this is going to be what sort of serves as a bridge 
for people to move towards a more interdisciplinary sort of curriculum. Um, I think it's hard a lot of times, it's challenging sometimes for teachers to say, okay, how can we collaborate together? What are some of the things we can do? But when we're looking at why we're trying to teach the skills of design thinking, um, and we're looking sort of like, you know, the political issues we have around us, the environmental issues of climate change that we have around us, I think a lot of sort of the knowledge and the facts and the things that kids are getting from, you know, math and science and history and all these things are going to ultimately help them work together collaboratively to be able to solve the kinds of problems that they're going to be in the situations that kind of need to be solved. And, you know, I think it starts really small. Like the other day I was doing a workshop um, with a group of middle school teachers and um, they were, you know, working through sort of their essential questions and, you know, kind of deciding what it is that they were going to create their design thinking unit on. And she came up with this awesome one that had that was centered sort of on the... Um, the Black Death and the Crusades, and the way she set it up was, you know, she was like, well, in the beginning, sort of her essential question was, you know, how do the Jewish, the Christian, and the Muslim people sort of experience the Black Death? And so right there for me, like as a history teacher, you know, we're always trying to think of ways to bring in historical thinking, you know, how to, instead of us telling students about the past and kind of dictating the past to them, how do you kind of place them in the driver's seat to really, you know, be investigators? You know, let's have empathy, you know, like that see, think, feel, do map that we had up a little while ago when you're looking at one group of people how might they see this perspective how might they think or feel what might they do and then looking at it sort of through like the eyes of these different groups allows students I think to have a much just I think a much deeper context for understanding historical events and I'm going on the history one because that's what I used to teach or you know if I was teaching this is I, I mean this is like a dream come true for most history teachers but even if we're thinking of events like World War II, or if we're thinking about the Vietnam War, you know, really if we're even to take today's current political context, if we wanted to talk about current events in the classroom, I think it's very easy to make judgments, but I think for students to really be able to sort of really have those skills of critical thinking and analysis versus just jumping to certain judgments or conclusions, I think being able to have them start with that empathy piece is just so, so, so critical. And it may not even always be that they completely get to the end, I think sometimes, you know, maybe even just being able to sort of master the initial kind of steps, um, being able to have the empathy, being able to define your problem statement, I think can be really, really, really helpful. I also really like that example. I don't um, know if you guys can pull up the slide from Design 30, uh, the Design 39 campus in San Diego. There, I believe, a K-8 school. And, you know, Common Core standards, they have the whole thing there. Um, but they are their entire curriculum is centered on using design thinking to teach all of these traditional curricular areas. And the one that I really, really, really liked was how they taught writing, you know, really kind of giving it a purpose. And I think when you look at that writing example, I don't know if we're able to pull it up. Let's see what slide it is. It is slide. That one? Oh, no, it's not on here. It's not on here. Oh, this no, one? About the process? It's no. not. No, you know what? I don't think we pulled it in. Um, what they do oh. is, for example, they do a nonfiction piece on the Titanic. And before they even get to writing, you know, about the character, writing this nonfiction piece about the Titanic, they have them kind of, you know, ideate and just kind of empathize, oh, sorry, they have them empathize with all the different social classes um, to really kind of gain an understanding of where it is they're coming from. And then they go in, they write their essay. But when they do the peer editing, it's, you know, they kind of have a purpose now for what they're editing. They're not just looking for grammar or spelling and this and that. They're looking for, do I feel what your character is feeling? You know, am I able to kind of put myself in that place that is that you're trying to get the reader to be able to go to and they're kind of editing from that perspective um, and I think that was um, I really like that example of how the because I think we all do peer editing so there's a lot of things I think that we're kind of already doing and sometimes just kind of placing things within this framework um, gives you a little bit of a different perspective on how you're able to um, teach that same curriculum. I, I like that thinking Saba and I like even more the idea that like you don't necessarily have to embrace the whole process and your class doesn't have to become a design thinking classroom in order to take advantage of this like having kids work even just through the first two phases of this like if you could have a student look at a historical event um, read a novel like whatever it is that they're going to do maybe in the courses you wouldn't necessarily think were in, along the lines of like science, engineering, building, design thinking, like that could be valuable and I, I remember working through ideas of, you know, having students examine an, an era or a time period and not necessarily posing 
any questions to them, you know, as an example in a history class, but the expectation is that they're going to empathize with the players involved and then define multiple problems. And maybe the point is not even that they're going to be able to ideate and prototype and solve the problems, but just identify unique problems that they can develop on their own. Great. Yeah. Greg, I'm... Oh. No, I was just going to say that I think that's, that's totally on point. I think a lot of it isn't even just like, you know, um, being able to actually solve problems. It's actually being able to like seek them out as well and being able to, you know, where are they going to come up from or just, you know, yeah. I agree. I'm glad you said that actually in that we, we were having a nice chat over on the side, but, um, you know, that's what's come up is that, you know, like the real aspect of design thinking is like that whole problem finding approach. You know, that was what Mary had said. Um, and then uh, Christina has joined us and, you know, she made a great point too about thinking in terms of, you know, like that we're, if we think about it within the context of, of a discipline, like in the disciplinary experience that we can think about how do we research to gain empathy and so we can tie it in more academically. Um, and then, you know, how does, you know, she brings up another great point, like how can disciplinary knowledge like start to help you design new things for new people? Um, so I thought that was another piece. Um, and so, you know, it's just, I think, thinking about how it starts to fit as that structure and that scaffold for your thinking and just in working with teachers even to be able to say, like, this is a way that you can, it's a strategy, like, to think of it as really this strategy for scaffolding the way that you present things and the way you encourage your students to engage with the content um, so that more than just saying, like, oh, yeah, this is the process, like, work through it, you know, we... You know, in my workshop today, we had to talk about, well, it's not that you do design thinking sometimes, but maybe not others, but how do you think about it as, you know, as a framework even for your own instructional decision making of ways that you're getting students to engage in a deeper way? Um, um, but I, I, it's been a nice chat over on the side, so for those of you who are still there, keep it coming um, in terms of where we want to go next. So I don't know where we want to go next. So I just have one other uh, example to throw in uh, that actually is at the fourth grade level. So even, you know, with, you know, the fourth grade level, we have a teacher who works with students who are, who can be reluctant readers, uh, particularly the boys. And so he uses a series of books by Gary Paulson called The Hatchet series and it's about a boy who is stranded in the wilderness after a plane crash and has to survive. And so in order to really get the kids reading carefully, doing careful reading and close reading, he actually has the kids design something that would have helped that protagonist survive in the woods. And so when you're, the idea that they came up with was survival pants, that if he had a pair of survival pants that had a, an emergency beacon on them, so when he goes to sleep, they actually have a strobe that's kind of going that, you know, it would have been great if he had had that, or, and then they decided that uh, it should have uh, colored tape that kind of spells out in Morse code, uh, SOS, and they actually went and built the survival pants. They went to an Army Navy surplus store and they got some old fatigues and they used uh, reflective tape and they kind of sewed the reflective tape on. They had a parent come in and volunteer to help with the students and teach them a little bit about sewing and they actually even made it into a uh, coding activity by creating um, some patterns that these light, they actually sewed some lights actually into the side of the pants with this parent's help and they actually had it flashing. Uh, so these were, a, it was a way to take what was in the literature and actually make it real and give the kids some agency in terms of thinking about how could I have changed this story and you know what, what would what would have helped him in this situation and so in the empathize piece they really had to read and understand okay you know here's here's where he was and these were the materials that he could use so it was um, you know it was a really just a neat a neat thing uh, to do it didn't really um, you know he still goes over the book it wasn't like he had to turn his entire curriculum upside down in order to incorporate this this was just an extension to you know uh, something that he was already teaching them and so you know it's um it's i think it's just a neat example of how you can take some of these elements of design thinking and um you know use them to kind of transform a lot of what we're already trying to do with our kids and get them to put themselves in the character and understand the the context um 
You know, Doug, you brought up a great point. It actually echoes something, you know, else from the, the chat over here that Mary Cantwell made a great point where she says, you know, like design thinking is a, it's a process and it's like it's a mindset approach. Um, and she even makes the point as well that like as teachers, if we're designing for our end users, which are our students, you know, then if we really start to think about how do we design our spaces and our lesson plans and our activities, you know, with it, with that idea of empathy towards our students, how might that, how might that play out or transpire instead? Um, and it's interesting that, you know, she made that point. I've been actually thinking about that in my own workshops where, you know, I might go in thinking, oh, yeah, I know we need to go down this pathway, but instead of saying, I think we should go down this pathway of really trying to step back and spend more time understanding, like, where are you right now and how can I better meet you where you are? And so it's really changed the way I even think about doing workshops with teachers um, in terms of, of how I might want to go forward with it from there. So... You know, I think as teachers as well, it, you know, maybe we're not even having our students do it yet, but how do we use this as a way to impact our own thinking? Um, and then, Saba, I know you had a point, too, about, like, how do we use this if we're thinking about our instructional practices? You know, how do we even think about it with something like feedback? So I'm going to turn this over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think for me that's been sort of one of the most interesting things, especially working with, like, older students who are so used to the idea of grades being so final and feedback being a little bit more of, like, a negative thing than a positive sort of learning experience that they feel like they can get, they benefit from, that's something that they look forward to. Um, and I noticed that when I began teaching this course to these graduate students, this concept of, like, iteration and this concept of feedback um, being a positive thing that wasn't necessarily tied to a grade um, was something that was very, very, very foreign to them and that caused a lot of stress and anxiety. And um, if we jump really quick to like slide 36, Carl Hooker, um, who I just did a presentation with a couple weeks ago, had this awesome slide called the game of school. Right? And so by the time students kind of get to a little bit of the older levels, um, they kind of have mastered, you know, this game of school where they know the certain procedures and formulas they kind of have to follow. And one of the things that I've noticed design, design thinking has kind of done is, you know, it's not about that end product so much anymore as it is, you know, the process that you kind of went through. And I think that's a really, really, really powerful shift because there's so many conversations these days about, you know, the role of grades in classrooms. Um, you know, do grades help students? You know, what should grading look like and things like that. Um, and I think if we want students to become sort of like these lifelong learners, you know, collaboration and feedback and being able to sort of just grow from your initial place um, is so, so, so critical. And one of the things we did in my course this semester is we, you know, we kind of did like a shark tank kind of scenario, um, but we called it a guppy tank to make it like a little bit more friendly for the students. But it was interesting because they were just not they would just, it caused a lot of anxiety to have them to come up, do a presentation, and to show something that was unfinished. Um, and you know, it to them it felt like you know, well, I'm going to fail, and you know, it's going to be embarrassing, and I don't want to share this yet because I'm not ready. You know, my presentation's not finished; it's not finished. Um, but the idea that you know, you get feedback kind of along the way, and you just kind of throw something out there, and you get feedback on this sort of you know initial unfinished piece um, was something that, I, like I said, caused a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. But um, we got this awesome comment from this one student that I thought was just sort of so telling. Um, right after when we had them do a little reflection. Um, she talks about how it was so unnatural to have the rules of class tweaked to focus on working together versus working on just getting a grade. Um, and she kind of like, you know, this 27 year old who just ends with, yeah, it was a nice feeling, you know. So I think for me the assessment piece in just using this model um, to be able to have students get sort of that feedback on a regular basis to know that it's okay to, you know, have this unfinished product that, that's just going to, you know, something that you're going to be able to keep improving upon. I I think is something that's um, a little new sometimes you know it's usually like you know this is your score this is what you got that's the end um, whereas design thinking says you know there is no end it's about this process continuing on and on and on and on um, that's always going to sort of be evolving so I liked that shift in the way we think about assessment through this process. You know yesterday we were having this conversation about like when is it okay to fail and so as we had worked through this design thinking process and we talked about the idea of like iterating and testing and prototyping, um, we started identifying like where's the safe space to fail? And like it's the safe space to fail when you're at this part in the, the process. And you know, maybe there's a ramification down the line. Like maybe there's something important, but you know, in this moment, like it's okay. And so, you know, 
we had a couple of failures. I had a great epic fail today, and I'm like, that's okay. We were testing this out. We're just going to move on, and it's all right. Um, but it, it is something that you know teachers are unsettled by it, and students are unsettled by it. But it gives us an opportunity to know that that it's okay. Well, one of the neat things that we've seen happen at our school since we've been using design thinking and really kind of getting a common vocabulary is you'll actually hear faculty members now using some of these terms that come from design thinking, like failing forward, that you know you can learn from failure. I, I love the comment that came up. Uh, I think it's Mary's comment about the idea of incorporating uh, the growth mindset, Carol, Carol Dweck's growth mindset, along with when you introduce design thinking. Um, we also have a term that I hear people using now called a non-precious prototype. That it's an idea that there's a prototype that it's okay to be broken. It's okay for it, you know, we, we don't have to treat it with kid gloves. We're going to really poke it and prod it and kind of form it and try to make it even better. And um, in faculty meetings now we'll hear people talk about the non-precious prototype or failing forward as a way to move ahead with this idea. And so it's really led to kind of a transformation on campus in terms of how we think about the process of designing anything from curriculum to different policies uh, at the school to you know working with students we're trying to really model uh, what it is that we're trying to get the students to do and it's you know it's not easy <laughs> but the more you do it the better you get at it and you know I think you you know you've hit on a lot of points and it's been great to have everyone in the chat as well but it does I think what's nice is it's putting a almost like a safety net in and, and a little bit of like a guidepost for like how can we really start to move forward um, you know Greg mentioned it we've done a lot of workshops now with a lot of different schools all over the world and you know now they've had devices for a while and they've been doing things for a while and now they're going okay so what's changed um, you know, I've had, whether it's iPads or Chromebooks or Windows tablets, like I've had these forever and now it's changed. And so it's really about now how do we start to really change that mindset? And so this has been a really nice way to start providing teachers with a framework for their thinking, you know, and a way to provide that framework for their students' thinking. Um, so on that note, I don't know, Sava, you're staring at me. Does anyone else have anything uh, else you want to add? No, I, think that's a, I think that's a good note to end on. I think, you know, um, it's all about the process. I think, you know, a lot of people are asking, like you said, those questions about kind of where to go next. And I think a lot of us, you know, we bring up this word of creative problem solving, problem solving. Um, and I think this has been a really positive step in that direction that I think I've seen a lot of schools, a lot of teachers, a lot of students just embrace and just be able to do some wonderful, wonderful things. It's really kind of just made technology, you know, just that pencil, just that tool, and really allowed students to kind of, you know, um, be able to kind of really get those skills and begin enhancing those that, you know, we all um, want them to be able to have. And I guess for me in wrapping up, I'd just say to think about your experiments with design thinking as a non-precious prototype. Um, mm -hmm. Poke it, prod it, see what works. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's a flexible framework and you can kind of use the portions of it that work for you. And, um, you know, just we're all trying to get better at, at doing this. And so uh, to whatever extent we can help each other and provide support and resources and kind of grow and, and change as we kind of really think about this new way of, of looking at, at modeling learning for students, something we can all kind of get better at together. Yeah, well, you know, thank you both Doug and Saba. Thanks for joining in tonight. I know Greg had to disappear and run. Um, he, we lost him. And then thanks again to the folks in the chat. Like, this has been fantastic. You know, Mary and Christina, and uh, there's been a couple of other guests who've popped in and out. So thanks for all of your insights and your comments. And then, you know, just as a reminder for everybody, um, this recording is up. We don't take anything down. You're welcome to share it. Please do. Um, the slides that I did a miserable job trying to play side Jackie with are all available as well. You can flip through them and probably have them make more sense that way. Um, so those are up there and then just you know to let everyone know if you want to come get hands on with this we're going to do a number of design thinking workshops this summer um, so Saba's leading them out on the west coast, Greg's on the east coast, Doug's going to be all over the place um, and so you know I'll do things too so those are definitely some things just to keep in mind and thanks to Mary again she's been a huge resource as a reminder in five minutes the design thinking chat starts um, so you can join that as well. And I know their hashtag, their fantastic community, it's um, DTK12 chat. So come join, you know, definitely join in over there. I know I've learned a ton from that group. So it's a really excellent community to have around. Um, so thanks to everybody for joining us. And I guess have a great night. So night. <laughs>